Thank you, Dave. Uh, good morning to you all. It's nice to be with you. I haven't lost my sense of humour. Uh, it was a tough time, I, I would admit, at a personal level and for my wife in, in particular, but uh, sense of humour is an important in, in leadership qualities and uh, we, we move on. It's all about this for rowing and the rowing story. I get asked the question all the time, why is rowing so successful and when are we going to get a men's eight? Well, we've answered the second one and the first answer is to do with this. And you'll know as senior leaders, if you don't have a culture which you protect into the future, you'll have cults. And cults are short-lived and die, and can be very damaging. And so in the room, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Andrew Matheson and his time with rowing, uh, Chairman Jerry Dwyer, who have been the keepers of the culture, and who have now passed that culture and that responsibility on to the likes of myself, uh, Mahe Drysdale as a senior athlete, Emma Twig, Rebecca Scowan, and those keepers of the culture are so important in uh, keeping the complexity out of our world. It is about keeping it simple, and lack of clarity provides complexity. So it's, rowing makes tough decisions, and I have to disagree with Peter Larry yesterday. Uh, Peter, I did speak to you this morning, but the niceness that you found in New Zealand culture as a generalisation is not found in rowing. Um, so there are very tough decisions, and you'll see we've fronted a number of them over the years. Emma Twigg's decision to leave the programme, dropping Joseph Sullivan as Olympic gold medalist eight months later, uh, and obviously our recent um, media profile as well shows that we're prepared to make the tough decisions to keep things simple and to be true to our culture. Therefore our purpose is clear and while the academics don't like it, our, our strategic map is on one page, it's got a vision and it's got a purpose statement. So it was interesting again Peter listening to your session yesterday afternoon, we don't have missions and bullet points and a whole lot of words, we have a one pager with a vision and a purpose statement about what we're about. Coping strategies, uh, sometimes it feels a little bit like the, the photo, but when, you're, when your purpose is clear and you look at uh, Dame Diane's uh, presentations yesterday, uh, in the right-hand bottom column of her quad, quadrant that she had on the screen as you looked at it, best practice talks about tightly constrained and no degrees of freedom. And that is the tough environment that rowing uh, provides and the no um, excuses environment. There is a lot of freedom because if you don't do the erg times or you don't want to do what your coach tells you, you're free to go and do something else. <laughs> so why do you exist? I'm not going to cover this slide for too long because the why has been covered many times throughout uh, the last two days. But um, the outcome is, again, something Peter touched on yesterday, is very clear as to why our athletes are there and why we exist as an organisation because we are a high-performance culture and a high-performing sport and it is about the Olympics every four years. We're not a Commonwealth Games sport. So our athletes commit to a four-year cycle and there are prognostics and very stringent uh, measurements along the way. And every Wednesday and every Saturday right now leading into Rio, they are getting those prognostics, uh, comparison against world best times, fed back to them as to how they're tracking. So we are lucky in that regard as a sport. We're able to make things pretty clear and provide instant feedback. I don't have time today to go over this slide, but I thought it might resonate with many of you in the room in terms of the complexities that we are all dealing with because for me the complexities come from the past. The future is very clear and that's why we're in our leadership roles, is to provide the future and to provide that clarity and to keep that clarity. The complexity comes from the past. For me, ownership of uh, properties is quite important and what we did successfully in recent times is we absorbed the complexity. The Aon Māori Cup was run by a uh, secondary school rowing association who at the time had a an honorarium paid to a well-meaning volunteer running a 2,500 athlete event once a year very successfully and it was creaking at the seams. So we took over the governance and the management of that, therefore absorbing the complexity that was created by having to deal with volunteers and somebody working part-time and getting to things when they could. Uh, also in the university space we've uh, absorbed the University Rowing Council within Rowing New Zealand and both of those examples are we've done that at a governance level as well as at a management level and that has allowed us to have a less complex space by owning those properties. And once again the message is very clear through to a centralised programme. If you're an athlete in the rowing system you know that you're coming to Karapiro and you know where you track on that arrow. Now everybody in this room could do an arrow like that, there's nothing unique in this. What we do is we put this arrow up everywhere we go to every new rowing parent, every new junior athlete so they can see where they fit and they can see where the opportunities are. It is not a complex picture but one that's very powerful when you come into the sport of rowing, you need to know where you're heading. I worked with this saying uh, 
at a personal level on a day-to-day -day basis and respecting the past and relevant for the future. So if the complexity is created by the past, how do you then absorb the past and respect it? Well, my uh, approach this year is to launch a new legacy program that we haven't had in our recent past and to follow the lead of the New Zealand Rugby Union and the Black Caps in giving a numbering system to our former representatives back from day one through to today. So while I'm having tough conversations about challenging the past and those who are living in the past, I've also got a project going on to respect the past. And that has been very well received because it meant we've brought a lot of people into our tent that were a long way from the sport. And obviously relevant for the future actually is just as challenging as the complexities of the past because of today's generation of athletes and their expectations. I'm not going to talk to you uh, as senior leaders about partnerships and it's been well covered today, but this next slide is a photograph of pa partnerships in action. And Michelle mentioned her boss, Matthew Cooper, uh, who's a leader in our region and one who's respected in the Waikato and being a Waikato-based sport, if Matthew Cooper says to do something, then I do it. That's where the partnership started to slide a little bit. <laughs> um, but in true partnership fashion, I was the rear end of that uh, elephant. So in summary and in conclusion, those are my five points in dealing with complexity um, and providing clarity for the future. I'm happy to take questions, obviously, but have a conversation. There's much more to the rowing story. And just because my presentation has been brief, it doesn't mean that we don't have complexity in the background. It's how you front it and how you lead it going forward into the future. We had a vision of being, to be the best rowing nation in the world. And when you achieve that, and when we achieved that in 2014, for the first time in our history, based on a system by um, a point system from our international body, the challenge for us now is where do you go from being the best in the world? And so our challenge is to provide that direction for the sport from here, but to do it with great clarity. Thank you. Questions for Simon. Yeah, telling isn't selling is something I learned on a sales course many years ago in terms of communication. And again, we heard it yesterday in some of the afternoon presentations. When you've got complexity and you've got change happening, telling someone your story isn't selling it to them. You've got to listen to their story and absorb their information and then tell it back to them. Um, obviously bringing in the uh, Aon Māori Cup and New Zealand Secondary School Rowing Association into our tent was one filled with massive history and obviously it's not a Rowing New Zealand is going to do this therefore you should do this with us. It is actually about listening to them and providing a response that is palatable to them and shows a partnership approach. So I learnt many years ago that telling and talking at people is not the way to get um, a complex situation and provide clarity. One question um, I'd have, um, the, the arrow uh, that you put up, very powerful, uh, you could read that as being, well rowing is very formulaic, if you, if you get on that pathway then um, it is, you just follow through and that, that leads to results, which would tend to indicate um, and, and verify or back up people that say well actually rowing and high performance is, isn't actually that complex, it, it's just, it is formulaic, it's, it's complicated if not simple. Um, is that the way you view it? It's a bit of a challenge for the whole theme of this, uh, this conference, actually. Yeah, well, actually, as you said to me, Dave, in preparation for this seminar, where you have people, you have complexity. And regardless of your number of participants and your history, how old you may be as an organisation, in fact, the older you are, the more complexity you have because the more people you have with a view of how it used to be. So I think it's actually about people management, if I was to sum up the answer to your question. Mm. Any other questions? Gretchen. Yeah, I'm trying to get the, that complexity of the past and that bloody national body attitude to get some reality around. There's a lot of rumours that go around a sport um, in the boat park. In Rowan's case, it tends to happen in the, in the boat park. Get buy-in from that older generation that they can see firsthand and hear firsthand from the chief executive and the chairman what we're trying to achieve as opposed to hearing about it in the boat park. 
And so that's a, a communication plan uh, under the title of a legacy project. So I've um, set up a senior leadership group within the athlete, um, within our current athletes. We've got 56 elite athletes training today at Karapiro. And within that, I've got 12, Eric Murray, Hamish Bond, Rebecca Scowan, Mahe, et cetera, that I communicate with on a quarterly basis. Um, just the chief executive and them, no other influences, conversations. And so I bring them up to speed with what's happening. We have a weekly communication uh, via email. In many cases, I think today you can over-communicate with today's generation. You've got to be very careful about what you want to actually communicate and what you want to actually achieve. One last question. Hands up those of you that know someone who goes for a row on a Sunday morning for fun. <laughs> Selwyn Meister. <laughs> Thanks, Selwyn. That's the first hand I've ever had put up to that question. <laughs> there is no social element in that regard. The, the uh, whole of sport forum that we run, the feedback we have from the current generation uh, out of a national survey was they wanted more social interaction. And every time I go to the Aon Māori Cup and every time I go to our Bankstream National Champs, there's nothing but competition and even our Masters are competing. The social element is an opportunity for us in terms of that future vision, but right now the, a high performance element is dominating. So we have a real dilemma around retaining athletes, as every sport does, because there isn't anything but the 2,000 metres and the competitions that you are training for. So it will be breaking down some huge barriers to bring in 1K races, even twilight competitions, whatever it might be. It's a, it's a massive challenge for us, Leslie. Excellent. Please join me in uh, thanking Simon.